Hi everyone, today I'm going to be talking to you about unraveling iOS obfuscation techniques. There we go. All right, so who am I? I'm Lori Kirk. I'm a reverse engineer at Microsoft. I specialize in cross-platform malware analysis with a focus on mobile threats. I also run a YouTube channel called Lori Wired, where I explore a ton of different topics on reverse engineering, malware analysis, as well as programming. And today, I will be representing myself as a security researcher, not representing Microsoft. And if you would like to follow along with any of the analysis materials, feel free to scan the sketchy QR code. I promise it just links to my GitHub. Or you can just go to the link directly if you don't trust me. All right, so let's get right into it. Let's take this mangled iOS application code, and let's demangle and deobfuscate some Swift and Objective-C iOS application binaries and make them look more like this. Which brings me into our agenda today. We're going to learn about the layered approach to iOS application protections. We're also going to reverse engineer some obfuscated iOS IPA binaries. And then I'm going to provide a new open source repository to the community where I include an iOS reverse engineering wiki, as well as multiple custom Gager scripts to clean up your iOS binaries, and some example iOS IPA files that you can use and practice deobfuscating. Now, I'll do a quick background. First of all, what is obfuscation? It's anything used to try and obscure the underlying functionality of the application. This is common among many different platforms, but it's particularly important in iOS applications because they include a lot of additional symbol or extra resource data compiled inside of the iOS application bundle. Now, there's offensive and defensive reasons for uh, obfuscation. The defensive, of course, would be legitimate iOS developers trying to protect their applications from reverse engineering. And then the offensive reasons would be those techniques employed by malware authors to try and prevent reverse engineers like myself from taking apart their application and realizing that it is indeed malicious. Now, let's move on to the layered approach of iOS obfuscation. Now, first of all, at the top level, these are going to be the techniques just by design for Apple trying to protect applications on their App Store. But then the bottom two techniques are going to be employed by the malware authors themselves inside of their code to create code obfuscation or runtime protections to try and prevent reverse engineers from checking out their application. So let's talk about the first layer, App Store encryption. Now, iOS apps are encrypted on the App Store. Apple includes this Fair Play digital rights management process, and part of that process includes encrypting the iOS application bundle, which is going to be that IPA file that I mentioned. Now, the process looks something like this. The developer of the iOS application submits their code for a review, and then part of that fair play process is going to be Apple encrypting that generated IPA file and then putting the encrypted version of that application on the iOS App Store. Now, this isn't going to be decrypted until it's actually installed in a physical iOS device. Now, trying to get that application is a challenge from the very beginning. So that's why this is included as kind of the top layer of protection of iOS applications. Since you really need to have a jailbroken device to be able to even get to the actual binary itself before you can begin your reverse engineering process. And there's a lot of tools out there that promise to get that IPA file for you that contains the application code. But if you look at it really closely, they're actually getting you the encrypted IPA file, which does absolutely no good for getting the static analysis of this application. And you might also burn your Apple ID in the process, so be really careful using any of these sketchy links that promise to get you the binary. But the important thing to note is that this does indeed help and effectively thwart a lot of different reverse engineering from even being able to get the application because all of this is so tied down and protected from being able to find iOS applications applications for reversing. Now, does anybody see any problems with me this methodology? Now, iOS developers think that they're secure and their applications are not getting reversed, which is true. However, that might make you think, maybe the malicious applications are also not getting reversed by reverse engineers because they can't even get the application binaries. But now we'll move on to the next layer of obfuscation. And we've, at this point, we've been able to get the binary, and we're able to start our actual reverse engineering process. So we're going to move on to code obfuscation. 
Now, code obfuscation is used by malware authors. They'll use a bunch of different techniques, for example, data encryption, identify renaming, or even trying to mess with the flow of control of the application by adding control flow obfuscation or dead code inside of their app. And remember I mentioned that iOS applications contain that entire symbol data and resource data compiled inside of the application bundle. For example, if you take a look at this Objective-C program and you're able to read some of the code inside of this, you'll notice that we have the original developer method names inside of this code. So even if you're not familiar with Objective-C or even programming, all you need to do is simply be able to read the method names, and a lot of these are given to the methods by the actual malware author themselves, and you're able to figure out exactly what this application is doing simply by being able to read method names. Now, Objective-C was replaced by Swift back in about 2014, and so a lot of newer iOS applications are going to be written in Swift or a combination of Swift and Objective-C, since they're very interoperable with each other. But Swift introduced a lot of obfuscation just kind of by design. And the main kind of obfuscation that it introduced was name mangling. Now, this takes the original developer variable method and class names and combines them with the types of parameters as well as the types of return values. So you get this kind of jumbled name at the end inside of your application binaries, although this does ensure uniqueness inside of the compiled program. So now it looks something like this. This is a very simple method, but all of the names inside of this Swift application have been mangled. And you'll notice when you first open up a Swift binary, it's kind of daunting because you can't find any human readable variable names without the demangling process. Which brings me into our first hands on, which is going to be demangling some Swift application names. So now, first of all, I'm going to open up my iOS application. And this application is available for you inside of my repository. And this is a demonstration of control flow obfuscation, which gonna be, we're going to be talking about a little bit later. Now, first of all, when you open this up, this is the Maco binary inside of our iOS IPA bundle. And I've thrown this into Ghidra, and I'm taking a look at one of the methods. You might be able to see that this name is looking a little bit strange. So this is one of the mangled names that includes the encoded types as well as the original developer variable names kind of jumbled inside of it. So now the first way we can demangle this is manually, and then we're going to automatically demangle all of our names inside of this. Now luckily, Swift by design has a demangler built into it. So all we need to do is have Swift installed on our system, and we can simply copy this name and pull up a terminal and do Swift demangle, and then paste in our symbol name. And then there, by default, we're able to get that this mangled name right here actually corresponds to the control flow flattening class, which is calling the with complex control flow flattened method inside of that. Now, if we look through the code, we see we have so many variable names that are mangled inside of this. So we want to automate that process. I've created another script also available in the repository that's going to do this for us. So now let me open up my custom Ghidra script. And what this is going to do is it's going to find all functions and all labels inside of our binary and automatically fix those names by calling Swift on the back end. So I'm going to get this script running. So now it's going to go through, and it's going to find every single function defined inside of here, and it's going to automatically fix that for me. And it's going to start with this and create a comment that has the original mangled method name inside of it, and then the demangled version, and then it's auto going to set that new demangled name. And if we look through the code, we see now this is looking a lot more human readable. We can find all of these different method names and read them very easily and get much better understanding of what this is doing. So now let's go back to our slides. And let's continue on. Now we finished demangling Swift. And you might have noticed that Actually, demangling this was really trivial in reality. So even though this kind of looks obfuscated by design, this is really easy to bypass and get around. And we're still able to get through this and fix our binary inside of Ghidra. 
Which brings me on to identifier renaming, which malware authors will use to try and remove any of those symbols that might be potentially demangled inside of our application. So this prevents reverse engineers from finding those original developer symbols. And a lot of open source tools are available online that developers will use inside of their Swift or Objective-C code. And they kind of name them to junk names like this, which is a mixture of letters and numbers, so that even if you demangle this, this doesn't mean anything to you, probably. Now, you may also be happy to know that a lot of other common obfuscation techniques also apply to iOS applications. Control flow flattening is a kind of technique where we have a chunk of code, and we take that chunk of code and we, at a high level, break it down into different blocks, separate those blocks into a switch statement or multiple if statements, place that inside of a loop, and then we have this additional dispatch variable which is now responsible for the flow of control of the application. So we're adding all of this overhead to our application to try and mess up how the code looks when we decompile it. Let's take this for example. This is a very simple method, which is just trying to see if my number is negative, positive, or zero. And let's apply just a little bit of control flow flattening to this. You see, we have our dispatch variable on the top. And now this is responsible in getting set inside of our dispatcher, which is going to be that switch statement. And the actual original code is broken down into blocks inside of here. Now, if you take this code apart, this is doing effectively the same thing as the previous slide. However, we've added this additional layer of obfuscation, and it's going to make the code really ugly and very much more challenging to reverse engineer. And this is effectively used in a lot of different iOS libraries, and it will produce in the more complex forms this kind of flattened graph. Now, every single one of those is a different block that is part of this control flow flattened function. And this is the graph thrown inside of Ida, or you can throw this inside of Ghidra. So it's going to give you much more complex kind of code to look at. And for our final code-based obfuscation technique, dead code, inserting this into our application is particularly effective inside of the iOS application ecosystem because the system is responsible for triggering different methods inside of the iOS app based off of the different life cycle events of the iOS application. So a, a malware author can insert some additional code inside of the application, and it's going to require a lot more overhead knowledge for the reverse engineer to know, is this method not referenced because it's dead code? Or is this method just simply triggered by the system for a different lifecycle event? So now we've talked about a lot of different code-based obfuscation. Let's move on to some different runtime protections. So we're going to talk a little bit about swizzling, actually a lot about swizzling. And this is a very Objective-C kind of specific technique. And we're going to talk about anti-debug, anti-tampering, and then we're going to finish up with some virtual machine-based obfuscation. Now, swizzling is part of the Objective-C runtime. It's built into it. And this is possible because Objective-C is able to perform introspection. So it's able to look at what classes, methods, and variables are defined inside of itself and be able to dynamically pull the implementation of certain methods or variables, as well as potentially exchange implementations all while the application is running. Now, this is primarily used in Objective-C, but this is possible in Swift as well, as long as the Objective-C types are used for our Swift methods. Now, you might be thinking, what can a malicious actor do with this? What they can do is they can take multiple methods and dynamically take hooks to those methods and then potentially exchange implementations. So what we have here is we have a malware author who's created normal method and malicious method, and they're using the Objective-C runtime method, method exchange implementation, after they've gotten a handle to their two target methods, then they're dynamically setting that implementation while the application is running. So this means that after the swizzling has actually taken place, every time we have a call to myclass.normal method, the implementation of actually malicious method is going to get executed. Now we're going to look at a, our second case study, which is going to be studying the Goontact malware family. And this was spyware discovered back in 2018, which exfiltrates photos and messages and steals all of that device info to extort its victims. And these were located on phishing sites that tried to convince the users to sideload these iOS applications or IPA files onto their device. 
So let's do our hands-on and let's look at some swizzling that Goontact actually uses. So I'm going to go back to my Ghidra instance. And this is my Goontact malware family right here. And I'm going to open up a second script. So this is going to identify potential swizzling used inside of the application. And again, this script is available for you inside of the repository. So let's open up our Ghidra script manager, and let's detect some swizzling. Now, this is going to look for all of the common Objective-C runtime methods that are associated with swizzling, and it's going to return any potential references and addresses that might be trying to call these methods. So I'm going to run this. And now it's going to scan through my application. And if you can see on the console, if anybody knows how to make the Ghidra console bigger, let me know, because I've been trying for too long. But this is returning all of the different potential addresses that are referencing swizzling. So I'm going to move up and see if we can find something interesting. Let's look at class get instance method and see what we can find. And I'm going to double click on this address, and it's going to take me to the location inside of the code that is referencing these methods. And now we see we have these two methods. It looks like we're trying to get references to these, this resume method inside of our class. And then we're going to call this suspicious looking swizzle resume and suspend method for class. Now, this is the actual name given to this method by the developer, which shows you how important it is to include identifier renaming as an obfuscation technique, because I can just double click this and say, that looks pretty interesting. Now, what's happening is, this AFUR session task swizzling comes from a library. So what they're doing here is they're using these Objective-C runtime methods to get the implementation of the original resume method and suspend method that are defined inside of the library. And then they're creating their own versions, AF suspend and AF resume. And these are defined inside of their own code. Now what's happening here? They're calling method exchange implementations, so that at each time the library code resume is called, it's actually going to be calling their own custom code, AF resume, and then the same goes for suspend. Now, if we keep on looking at the code, we'll notice that they're calling the original library code as well, but they're adding some extra functionality on top of it, which is going to be sending an additional alert every time they're calling this URL session resume and session load, session suspend. So let's go back to our code. And let's talk about this. Now, what this is effectively able to do is it's making the malicious code appear to be dead. Now, it's looking like this method is never actually referenced, when in reality, we're using these Objective-C runtime calls to swap behavior, and, making, and this method is still going to be referenced inside of our application. So next time you're wondering if you want to use complicated pointer arithmetic to dereference them and modify memory while the application is running, you might want to use Swizzling instead, since it's built into the Objective-C runtime for an obfuscation technique. Now let's move on to some different runtime protections, which are going to be anti-debug and anti-tampering. And these are really similar to anti-debug in any other platform, where they're trying to prevent a debugger from attaching, or potentially a hooking framework such as Frida from attaching to this process and trying to reverse engineer this application. Now, an additional check for iOS is trying to see, detect whether it's running on a potential simulator or emulator. And if it thinks that it is, it will try to avoid execution so that we can't see the potential malicious behavior as a reverse engineer. Now, some jailbreak detections include uh, many device heuristics that it's checking to see whether it has. So basically, the malware author is saying, do I think I'm running on a jailbroken device? If so, that means that the reverse engineer is potentially able to pull my application binary. So I don't want to perform any sp suspicious behavior so that they don't even notice that I'm here. One jailbreak detection for iOS, this is defined in the open source iOS security framework, which is a framework that's designed to protect your applications for many different runtime protections. They'll check to see if all these different custom URL schemes are available on the device. Now, these URL schemes are associated with different applications that are commonly installed on jailbroken devices. For example, the fills the file manager, if that's installed, well, there's a pretty good chance that this is running on a jailbroken device. And another thing would be 
Does the application have additional privileges that it sh probably shouldn't have? If it's able to access and write to a system file, applications probably should not be able to do that since they're running inside of their own application sandbox. So if they do have these permissions, then that means that the device is definitely jailbroken and it's running with some additional privileges. So now let's move on to our last form of runtime-based obfuscation, which is going to be virtual machine-based obfuscation or VM-based obfuscators. Now what's happening with VM-based obfuscators is we're defining an additional set of custom virtual instructions inside of the application. Now we have to have this additional overhead of this translation step, which is taking those custom virtual instructions defined entirely in software and translating them over to native instructions that are going to be able to be executed on the underlying device. Now, one method of implementing this inside of iOS applications at a high level is to have this bridge between Swift and C++ code. Now, the custom instructions, which are going to be completely software-based virtual instructions that actually correspond to real native instructions, they are defined over in our Swift code here at the moment and then sent over to native C++ code. The native C++ code defines the interpreter, which is responsible for inputting those custom instructions and then executing the appropriate native code based on that. So we have this entire translation process, which is defined inside of native code here. And this is an application of part of the VM-based obfuscator inside of C++, what one can look like. First of all, we have our virtual machine, which is defined on the bottom. This is just going to be the class that's going to be reading in that custom bytecode that we're defining in our software, and then tr calling the interpreter to translate that custom bytecode and perform different operations accordingly. And then it's going to be triggered inside of that execute method. Now, this is going to perform exactly the same thing as what would happen if we had the regular native code inside of the binary. But now, this requires the reverse engineer to go in, find the mapping of virtual instructions and native instructions, figure out how those work before they can even begin reverse engineering the native instructions themselves. Now, many popular applications employ VM-based obfuscators. And this is a really sophisticated technique. You may have heard of a social media application called TikTok. And I'm not using this as a malware example inside of this presentation. But they do employ a very sophisticated virtual machine-based obfuscator. So next time you come across a VM-based obfuscator inside of any of your code, you might wonder, what instructions are they actually trying to hide? And what data are they collecting that they really don't want you to find out? So now let's finish up with some real-world examples of iOS malware. Now, iOS, the iOS App Store can actually host malware, and there have been multiple cases of this. So despite all of the additional protections and our multiple layers of protections, mainly the top layer, which is trying to encrypt applications and prevent reverse engineering, this can kind of be a double-edged sword, where now these applications are not getting reverse engineered in a good amount of time. The first example of this is the InstaAgent malware. And this promised to be an additional component to your Instagram account. But in reality, it actually harvested all of your Instagram credentials. And even worse, it uploaded them in entirely clear text to its C2 server. So if you were listening to the traffic of the device, you could simply see Instagram credentials being uploaded and potentially steal their Instagram credentials as well. So the malware author also was just not very secure in how they were handling that. And this had around 500,000 downloads inside of the legitimate iOS App Store. Now to move on to our final, more notorious example. You may be familiar with Xcode Ghost. Now this was actually a Mac malware family that was a modified version of Xcode. Now Xcode is used to develop iOS, Mac OS, and a ton of different applications for different Apple devices. But what this did, did is it took some malicious code, it snuck it into the iOS applications while the developers were in the process of creating them. So that means a ton of legitimate developers who had previously uploaded a lot of different applications were unknowingly uploading malware to the iOS App Store. And this is a particularly uh, 
smart technique because that means that the previous legitimate le developers had undergone these different Apple reviews before, so they're not going to receive as much scrutiny as a developer who's uploading their very first app, for example. And this led to a ton of different iOS applications containing secret malware being uploaded and hosted inside of the iOS App Store. And there are potentially a lot of un undiscovered malware families that people are not reverse engineering. So uh, there are all of those different layers of obfuscation and protection are protecting applications from legitimate iOS for legitimate iOS developers, but potentially also offering some protection to the malicious iOS developers. So now go reverse engineer some iOS apps, and you should be able to solve this. Thank you. Uh, and I do have the link to my iOS reverse engineering repo if you want to, again, scan the sketchy QR code or just go to the Lori Wired reverse engineering repo. Thank you.